excited about this topic because it was a lot of fun to build, also, it's also a lot of fun to use. And graph algorithms uh, with a graph database. And uh, today uh, I want to talk a little bit about why we built them, um, uh, how they work, how you can use them, and uh, kind of where the future is. My name is Michael, I've been working with me for J48 years now, and kind of part of the inventory there. Um, so basically, um, what graph algorithms give us is uh, insight into structure. So we have a lot of data that we get from all, uh, all over the world, lots of different sources, and we can analyze this data kind of in the local um, space, so by doing a graph pattern query like you've like seen before, uh, where we kind of look at a neighborhood of a certain node, but uh, we want to uh, basically also be able to analyze the whole structure of the graph and take, take this information to get more insights. And um, so I want to talk a little bit about that, and then um, look at what uh, does, why does uh, graph analytics work now so well, didn't work so well before, and then we want to look how you would run such a pipeline and what needs to be done for for. I hope I find enough time for the demo. Um, I have a bunch of demos. And so uh, basically, is uh, there are different things that you can get from uh, analyzing graphs. So. One is uh, that you can look at uh, what are uh, information flows through, the, uh, through a network, for instance, if you have an energy uh, distribution network or another uh, distribution network, uh, traffic, and so on. And what happens if you interrupt this network in certain points? What are the crucial points in this network? For instance, if you uh, kind of uh, if a power station shuts down, that's on a critical path, then large parts of your network uh, can go dark because then you kind of destroy the critical path. The same is uh, true for traffic. All of you that, that, that have um, spent time in traffic jams uh, know that oftentimes it's just one junction that keeps all the traffic um, kind of back. And then if you resolve that, then everything is okay again. And so these kind of individual points in the network can have a lot of uh, impact in congestion, failure, and, and, and so on. Uh, other things are, uh, p uh, that you can get from path analysis is, for instance, efficiency in routing. So for, for internet protocols, but also for other flows of information, for flows of, of money, and uh, also other um, things like energy and so on. You also want to have alternative ways, you want to have uh, the most efficient way, the, the most uh, cost efficient way to get data from A to B. And there you also have to analyze a lot of uh, parallel um, paths to find the uh, uh, most efficient ones, uh, things like shortest path search, uh, routing, navigation in general uh, is something else. And then the other thing uh, that's uh, really interesting is that we can just by looking at the structure of graphs, we can already infer, infer a lot of, uh, of the global structure. We can also infer a lot of the like, local structure. So how many communities or clusters do exist in the past? Who connects clusters? Who is influential in the cluster? So I can see, for instance, all the people that are interested in a certain topic. And whom would I have to talk to, for instance, to spread an idea within this group? Or if I have uh, people living in a country and they are forming also clusters because you have urbanization and so on, and there's, for instance, a an, uh, disease spreading in this country. Where do I have to look for, for instance, to f stop this disease from, from spreading by uh, vaccinating the right kind of people, for instance, and then uh, kind of stopping the, um, the epidemic in its uh, initial point. The same is true for information flow. So who are the influencers in, in networks? And as we've seen with the um, US election, for instance, and also other elections, that uh, you can, by placing kind of influential uh, bot networks in the, in the right places, you can influence outcomes of um, political decisions pretty easily today. So there's a lot of stuff that we can learn from, um, from graphs in general. Uh, why does uh, graph analytics um, take off now? Uh, the animations are a bit uh, too much, I didn't do them. <laughs> uh, because we have uh, now the uh, compute power available. So, so one, so what, um, one aspect is that we have now the data available, so we can uh, get data from many different data sources. We can um, uh, combine data sources. We can bring things together. So one example is uh, the Panama Papers uh, data set where the journalists of the ICIJ 
collected, got the information from the from the leaks from the uh, law firms that uh, create shell companies, but then they augmented this data with sanction lists, census information, company company registries, ownership information, property ownership, and kind of by bringing all these networks together, they got a much completer picture of reality, more or less, right? And that allows them to do these. Um, Observations and on the other hand, you have also the compute infrastructure now available. Now, at like uh, at a swipe of your credit card, you can command like thousands or tens of thousands of CPUs and and um, uh, exabytes of, of RAM more or less at your at your uh, pro uh, uh, proposal. No, and uh, so you can also use all this c uh, compute capacity to. Um, to, to work with this data. And, and the two things coming together uh, kind of made it uh, possible that we now can do these kind of analytics uh, much easier. We saw from, from Jerry how easy it is, for instance, for Spark to just grab the data, uh, put it on Spark on a Spark cluster, and, and compute it, uh, uh, for instance, something like the, the Bitcoin. OK. Um, we can get a lot of insights from, from, from graph algorithms. I already mentioned things like failure points, uh, structures, and so on. But we can also do things, for instance, we can enrich networks for better recommendations so by understanding uh, human behavior patterns, so who did what in the past, but also how things are related to each other at larger scale. How do I do kind of compute similarities between large uh, intersections of, of items in a, in, a, in a retail store, or of movies, or of, of videos? Things like uh, Netflix created the micro categories for movies from like analyzing viewer behavior and analyzing on the other side kind of content information of, about movies that they had and and this is all possible by kind of taking all this data the structure and running algorithms on top of that uh, basically uh, Classical graph algorithms give you things like metrics. So what are centralities of nodes? So what's the importance? Uh, what's the influence of a node? Uh, what are clusters that we can find? What are other structural insights that we can get? But then on top of that, we can also apply machine, on, 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 uh, machine learning on graphs. So we can extract uh, embeddings for each node. Uh, so that means a node with a certain structural environment uh, and their properties can uh, form an embedding for a machine learning algorithm as an input. And then we can use that uh, as well uh, to not just classify uh, and, and predict information, but also use uh, the deep learning uh, algorithms to uh, detect, for instance, structures uh, that are at higher levels that we want to see. So you can use, for instance, things like uh, convolutional networks to also find structures in, in, in graph structures and not just in images. So that's kind of really interesting aspects. Something else that's really interesting is that actual, uh, all the neural networks that you use in, in deep learning are actually graphs. So they are kind of neurons connected with edges with weights. So you can also kind of put them into a graph or graph database or in graph analytics system to get more insight of how does this neural network actually work? What are actually influencing aspects? Uh, which parts uh, kind of um, participate in how in, in decision making and so on? So that's pretty pretty amazing. So that's something that we're currently looking into the right side. And uh, graph algorithms is something that we've already been working on. Uh, structures can hide in, in the graph. Uh, one example uh, that I really liked a lot is um, Game of Thrones. Um, Andrew Beveridge, a mat mathematician uh, from California, took all the Game of Thrones books, so all the five books that we have right now, because uh, Winds of Winter is not coming out yet, mm -hmm. right? Um, and analyzed uh, character interaction. So he looked at a book text and, and looked at which characters appeared within 15 words of each other. So that was either one character talking about the other character, two characters interacting, or um, any one ki character killing another character, and what what do you do usually, right? And and, and so he found in total uh, more than seven thousand interactions of characters, and put them all to, into an into an in interaction network, and then just ran some graph algorithms on that. And basically, what these graph algorithms do is they get the same kind of insight that you get from reading the books. So when I read the books, then I know, for instance, that. Tyrion is very influential because he's kind of involved with a lot of people and kind of doing all like his intrigues and so on. But um, the graph algorithm also gets the same kind of insight. So they, uh, if you look at, uh, for instance, uh, things like uh, page rank or so, then uh, where is it here? Uh, John has a high page rank and, and Tyrion has the highest page rank. So he's the kind of most 
influential person in this kind of interaction graph, right? So which I also know because I've read the books, but you know, a stupid graph algorithm who kind of, kind of can't understand the books and their like literary content uh, can come to the same conclusion. And that was quite, quite, an, quite, uh, quite an impressive thing for me to see. How do you re uh, run graph algorithms? So in the past, there were already many ways of running graph algorithms uh, on, on Spark with GraphX uh, or Graph Frames, on Apache Flink, uh, on Giraffe, on, on Turi, uh, Jazz Gradoop uh, from, from Martin, uh, the Boost Library, and, and so on. So there are many ways of running uh, iGraph, uh, many ways of running graph algorithms. Um, but what we from, from Neo4j wanted actually for uh, people using Neo4j is that they don't have to do so many moving parts so that they can just you take the data that they already have in their graph and just run a graph algorithms on top of that without having the um, additional um, things to do. So they also, what we also wanted to avoid is kind of to transfer data. Uh, so for instance, the, the Bitcoin graph that um, Jerry uh, showed before, I... Um, wanted to copy the data from, from one machine to another and it was like uh, these 600 gigs of, of data took like over eight hours to copy over, over the network. So if I transfer these large amounts of uh, uh, data over a network which is kind of not, um, not fast enough, then it also takes some time to do all the tra data transfer. And uh, scalability is more an issue with uh, classical uh, tools like iGraph in Python or in R. Uh, where they are bound to a single single machine and a single CPU, and um, that is sometimes also a problem. So we had an example from a partner company of ours called Right Relevance. They did Twitter analytics on the uh, US elections and uh, Brexit data, and also on other data like Ebola data and so on. And uh, they ran a pipeline like this. So they ingested the got the tweets from the Twitter streaming API, put it first in uh, MongoDB, then moved them over to Neo4j, and then um, did some uh, querying and aggregations in Neo4j, but then they also exported the data to Tor R, ran uh, certain uh, algorithms in R and iGraph, and then they took uh, some of the data, wrote it back to Neo4j, and had like a cycle of, of iterating there, and then they used uh, MySQL to uh, put the data into Tableau and uh, exported it into GraphML to get it into Gephi. So it's kind of the whole shebang of, of things that you can have, right? So it's like the, a hodgepodge of things. And so we were talking with them and they said we really would like to simplify this pipeline and make it, make it easier and remove lots of these kind of additional parts that we don't really need. We just needed them because the capabilities were not there. And uh, so we looked at that and we said, okay, actually, um, if you talk to us anyway, then we can also s kind of remove these things, right? So because you can access Twitter streaming API directly from Neo4j and put the tweets directly in, into the graph. Uh, with the uh, new graph algorithms, we don't need the iGraph stuff in R anymore. Uh, there's a Tableau connector for Neo4j, and there's also direct, direct Giphy integration for Neo4j. So actually, so if you already want to focus on Neo4j as your data store, then you can do all of these things without the other moving parts. And, and the thing that was kind of missing back then was the um, graph algorithms, and that's something that we uh, worked on um, since. So uh, what can we do in terms of gra graph analysis in Neo4j? Originally, Neo4j is a uh, transactional uh, database, so meaning um, it's meant for transactional workloads. So you can build like a retail system with that or an ordering system or a hotel reservation system or something like that where you have lots of small transactions going through the system, lots of reads, lots of writes, but not like large-scale analysis. That was not kind of the focus of Neo4j before. Um, but you could already do some analysis by using Cypher and just running Cypher uh, over, over your graph data, for instance, to comp compute uh, something like degrees or compute uh, small clusters and, and stuff like that. But it was not really efficient. Um, what we added as an additional capability in, to Neo4j was that we can implement now user-defined uh, procedures and functions. So that means you can write your own code which then becomes callable from Cypher. So you can keep your regular Cypher statement, but at a certain point you want to, for instance, do something uh, custom business logic, or you want to run an algorithm, or you want to do a special conversion, or you want to reach out to another database to pull in some additional data. And that's kind of really easy to do with these um, additional um, procedures, which we then also use as the approach to implement the graph algorithms. So all the graph algorithms that I will show you are also implemented as uh, user-defined procedures, so you can just call them from your Cypher statement. That means you can have an already existing Cypher statement that computes certain aspects, and then you just pass, pass parts of these results into the graph algorithms um, procedures, and then they uh, can use that. 
And with the results that come out of the graph algorithm uh, procedure, you can also, again, reach into your graph and pull, for instance, additional information uh, for, these, um, for these nodes and relationships. And all, all of that runs on Neo4j, so you don't have to leave like Neo4j's process, but it's all running in process for Neo4j, which is kind of really nice. And not just on a single node, so we can also uh, run these graph algorithms on dedicated compute nodes in a Neo4j cluster. So if you have like a regular cluster that runs your transactional workload, then you can also add a bunch of uh, uh, machines uh, that are larger sized and run as like uh, reporting or, or compute instances, and then you can run these graph algorithms on, on these uh, machines. So far we implemented uh, algorithms from three uh, areas. Uh, we did uh, centrality algorithms, community detection and pathfinding algorithms. Um, basically, you use them uh, like you use every other um, user defined procedure in, uh, in Neo4j. You can call them uh, with the call syntax, and then you have each algorithm has a name, so a prefix with algo, then the algorithm name, and then we have two variants. One is, has a stream suffix, which means it gives you the data back um, to your query. So uh, imagine you run a page rank, then you get all the nodes and their score uh, back to your query, which is okay for medium-sized graphs. But if you uh, stream back like a billion node, uh, billion nodes uh, to to the consumer, then it's pretty hard to to handle that kind of on the fly. And that's why we also have a second variant which doesn't has has the stream suffix, which just writes the data back to the graph. So each node, for instance, would get their score directly written written to as a as a property which is quite convenient because then you have it materialized in the graph and then you can, for instance, also use these scores in your regular uh, graph queries as well. So for instance, if I computed already centralities, then I can also just use them in my next query, for instance, to find what are relevant people or what are relevant products or relevant movies that have a higher uh, centrality score than other, uh, other ones and can use that to improve, for instance, the quality of recommendations. So that's the basic uh, approach. and. Uh, as parameters, you pass in um, optionally uh, a label that you want to have or a type, a relationship type, and then some additional configuration uh, depending on the algorithms. For instance, something like dampening factor or iterations or uh, weight uh, information and so on. And uh, that's one aspect. And the other thing is that we also want to have these projections. So if you were here for Yuri's uh, talk, he said that he actually uh, uh, had to create two separate graphs, one for the whole Bitcoin data model and one that has had only uh, transaction to transaction uh, information, so like a bipartite graph. And what we can do in, in these algorithms that instead of passing in here um, labels and relationship types, you can also pass in uh, one cipher statement that uh, creates a, a node list, one cipher statement that creates an, an edge list, and then it uses this virtual graph to run the uh, uh, computation. So you can take any graph data that you have in your, already in your graph and just project it to whatever you want to have. Right? So for instance, you have a Twitter graph uh, with, with users, tweets, hashtags, and all this other stuff, and mentions, and retweets, and replies. And for instance, you want only to have the user-to-user -user mention graph. Right? Then you just write uh, here, find me all the users, and then find me a user who posted a tweet which mentions another user and return user one and user two, and then perhaps the frequency uh, as well. And then you have a virtual projected graph with, which uh, then um, the algorithm is run on. And so you can project uh, your graph in, into any shape that you need or want to have for, for running these um, algorithms. OK, so what did we implement? We implemented in terms of centrality, uh, pitch rank as a baseline algorithm, between the centrality, closeness centrality, degree centrality, was already there in Neo4j out of the box, harmonic centrality as well. And we are also looking into some uh, other ones. And here's an example for page rank on DBpedia. Uh, so we uh, can just run page rank on DBpedia, stream the results, and uh, pass in uh, label and relationship type, and then return just the uh, top 20 nodes from, from DBpedia. And um, the same um, I can do with uh, writing the data back. And then I can pass in a write property where I can also say I have different properties that I want to write to. For instance, I can say I want to run page rank for this subset of my graph and write to property A. And I run, want to run page rank for this other subset for my graph and uh, write it to property B. And then uh, I um, get this statistics information back, uh, how, how long did it take to 
uh, to uh, compute the data, how long did it uh, take to write back the, the data to, to near future. So for community detection, we have currently um, limit propagation, unified, so weakly comp connected component, strongly connected components, Lorraine, and uh, we also added a triangle counting, uh, which is not really a community detection algorithm, um, which was quite interesting and uh, things that we want to look into uh, going forward is uh, something like Worktrap and InfoMap uh, as higher quality uh, community detection algorithms. And here are examples again. So these examples look similar, but uh, in the demo section we see uh, then kind of how they work in, in, in detail. Uh, and for pathfinding, we have a single source, shortest path, all nodes, single source, shortest path, uh, multi source, breadth first search, and then also in general parallel uh, breadth first search and depth first search um, uh, implementations that are mostly used by the other algorithms as an infrastructural uh, thing, but also exposed in the, in the library as well. And, so. and there's also Dijkstra uh, implemented and, uh, as a parallel Dij Dijkstra uh, as well. Okay, here's, uh, for instance, an example where I find a starting node and find all the single source shortest paths and write the uh, properties back to uh, the relationships uh, in between. So what allows us uh, to have these algorithms available, uh, we can, as I said before, we can combine lots of different data sources into one graph, run our compute, we can project the uh, existing graph to certain subgraphs, and enrich the data that we get uh, with uh, additional algorithms. And then we can use this to uh, run queries on top. Okay, cool. Demo time. Let's see. Uh, so first of all, um, when you uh, use Neo4j desktop, uh, then it's quite easy to um, install these algorithms. Uh, so basically the, the graph algorithm library, uh, I have links in the end, um, is an open source uh, library which is on GitHub. And um, mm -hmm. Any network runs? So you can find it on GitHub, the documentation is also there and also the releases, so you can also just grab the uh, jar for the uh, algorithm and uh, put it into your Neo4j server as a plugin. Um, or if you are running Neo4j desktop, you can also just uh, click on the bu bu plugins tab and then uh, install graph algorithms here with a single click as well. So it downloads the uh, correct version of the graph algorithms, adjusts the config and puts the jar into your folder. So if I look here on my plugins folder, uh, it has APOC and graph algorithms installed. Okay, and this is the Game of Thrones graph, so I can actually look at the uh, Neo4j browser for this graph, and uh, so first of all, when we look at this uh, data, we just see our characters. Uh, what's wrong here with my computer? Demo, demo gods. What? Let's try this again. Ah, oh, there you go. So this is kind of a small uh, subset of these uh, nodes. Here's Cersei Lannister with a bunch of other people. And here you see uh, that we have different, I can also make this bigger, different interact relationships. So we have for each of the books, you have a different interact relationship, so we can also kind of discern the different um, things from, from the different books. And um, so you see here, we have interacts one, two, three, and four and five. Uh, so the books two and four and five were actually only one book, but uh, George R. R. Martin split it into two. Um, so what we can also do is we can just see how, how big is the graph, uh, of course. Make it low. So it's 800 nodes and uh, 3,000 something relationships, I think, 3,800 relationships. Um, so we can also look at uh, like degrees, so we can um, just find all the characters and then return just the uh, size of the uh, BPN. Uh, just the uh, size of the nodes as degree and um,
So these are the, the nodes with the top uh, five degrees. Let's perhaps return the uh, name. So this is kind of the degree centrality which Cypher can already do out of the box. So there's nothing that we have to do in, in particular. So but if you take this network now and want to run some of the graph algorithms on top of that. Or what I first can run is uh, APOC uh, nodes. Oops. Is the degree uh, nodes? Damn it. Degree distribution. Um, so we can uh, start running al algorithms on top of that. So um, you can look at this degree distribution first and see what's kind of our uh, minimum, maximum degree of 148. It's maximum degree and then average as 6.5 with a standard deviation of 14. And uh, now we can run algor algorithms on top of that. What's wrong here? So here in this case, we run the page rank algorithm. Uh, and we run the stream version, so that, that, that's the version that returns the data to us uh, directly. And, um, and we uh, get, get back the node and its score. And we want to have for the top five nodes, we get the node name back and the degree of the node as well. So and it runs uh, page rank over the whole graph and uh, gives us the stuff back. So we get uh, Turin Lannister, Stannis Parathia, and Tywin Lannister have the highest um, page rank over all the books. And they're, that, that's their degree. Uh, and so we see even, uh, even as uh, Theon Greyjoy has a higher first level degree, its page rank is lower. So because not so many people um, uh, are connected to Theon Greyjoy as, for instance, to Tyrion Lannister, uh, also in the second, uh, sorry, as to Tywin Lannister in the second degree. Um, we can also uh, use that to, to write the data back to the graph, so that's actually pretty simple. So where we can just call uh, algo.pagerank, which runs pagerank on our, our graph with 20 iterations and writes this data back to the pagerank property. So from now on, I can also just uh, give me the character um, the ones that have a page rank because some of them also don't get one. And then uh, so and now I have these um, properties directly on, on my uh, nodes and can use them for further scoring, for instance. Uh, so similarly, we can uh, compute uh, between the centrality. So here, here we take just the between the centrality between characters from the first book, and then find a character, and um, because you get just the node ID back. And here we see, for instance, um, that between the centrality is, an, is a metric uh, that connect uh, that is high for nodes that connect clusters of, of uh, other nodes. So for instance, Eddard Stark is someone who connected many of the different groups in the, in the first book, right? Because after the first book, Eddard was not, not more, not anymore. And for, the same is uh, true for, uh, for Jon Snow and also for Rob Stark in the first book, and Robert Baratheon. And Turin was actually very uh, limited in terms of interaction. So in the first book, he was only in the um, uh, group of the, of the Lannisters. This changes later where he becomes more uh, involved. We could actually ch look in the books four and five if Turin has a better between the centrality? No. Stannis is still there, really high. And Jamie, interestingly. Uh, and Daenerys. OK, what else can we do? We can run cluster clustering on this. And here, uh, I wanted to show you how you do the, um, the cipher projection. So I just uh, do the first statement, uh, which returns uh, characters as node list, and then the second statement is all the interactions, and uh, we have just two characters, and uh, we can here sum the weights of the relationship. So each of the relationships in the interaction graph has a weight, which is the frequency of interactions, and we can also use that for um, computing the communities, uh, so in this case with uh, label propagation, and we write it to a community property here. So we can just uh, run this uh, on this graph, so it runs in a few milliseconds. And then we can, for instance, look at the uh, communities and their sizes. So 
the query here uh, finds all characters that have a community property and then counts the uh, groups them by uh, community. So we see we have some larger communities with more than 100, 150, and then it kind of uh, goes down really quickly to small communities of a few people. And if you look at one of these communities, actually, so for instance, I had here the one with community 124, somewhere down here, with only eight people. I want to see what, what's, who's actually in this community. And if you look at the graph, then we see that something that I didn't want to see. So this is record. Oh, that's not what I wanted to show, actually. Anyway, I think there's an something from something that I ran before. <laughs> so we can do the same with Louvain. And instead, here we write to the Louvain property. And let's see if this works now. Uh, and here we get the same community sizes again. Uh, do you see that Louvain is more evenly distributed? And here we can, for instance, this should actually be a network of Queen Circe. Yeah, so here we see uh, Circe in the middle and all the people that we know from her interactions, like Marion Trent and uh, the um, Cleganes are in here and uh, the, um, where, where is he? The other Lannister, Lancel Lannister, and so all the people around Queen Cersei are in this cluster around her. So you can really identify, if you have read the books and you know the story, then you actually know kind of all these clusters that you, you see here in these, um, uh, in, the, in these clusters are actually making sense uh, for you. That's actually quite, quite cool. Okay, cool. Um, here's an example for the, um, for the projected Twitter uh, graph that I mentioned before, so I have uh, Twitter users, uh, and uh, here's a mention graph, so a Twitter user to another Twitter user uh, via a mention in a tweet, and then we can just compute for instance page rank on top of this virtual graph uh, which we just projected. My next example is um, DBpedia. So I mentioned before, so DBpedia is a, is a data set of 11 million nodes and 116 million uh, pages, uh, links between pages. And we can r just run some uh, algorithms on top of that. And if my network works, let's see. Doesn't look like it. So let's see. Come on, do it. It worked all the time while I was watching the other talks. It's just not working when I'm doing my own talk. But I'm getting funny characters in an SH SSH connection. Anyway, that's a little bit frustrating. But I think I have it here as well, yeah. So, uh, uh, to run PageRank on, on this graph with 11 million nodes and uh, 117 million or 60 million relationships uh, takes 20 seconds, uh, which is kind of nice, uh, with 20 iterations. And uh, Union Find runs, I think, in uh, 40 seconds or so on DBpedia, so clustering on DBpedia, which is kind of a copy of Wikipedia pages uh, with all their links between each other, uh, which is kind of nice. And if you run something like... Um, page rank and get the results back uh, by, by ranking, then we see the, that uh, pages like United States, Animal France, list of sovereign states, these kind of listing pages are always really high up in the, um, the page rank because they have a lot of links pointing to them uh, because it says, you know, these, all these people are, uh, all these um, states are sovereign states. Germany shows also up. Uh, here's another projection example, for instance, if you say if you only want to have pages where uh, there's Europe in the title and run only a page rank between these uh, pages that are, are just a subset of my graph. Then I can do this as well. And this is my edge uh, node list and my edge list and then we can um, run this. I would love to show it to you but it seems that the network is not liking me at all. Okay. So be it. Um, okay. 
So we can do also funny, funny stuff. So on, on the clustering in, in GBpedia, what, what we can also do is, if you run something like a centrality, like, like page rank first, and then a clustering algorithm, you can also use the uh, centrality score to find the, uh, the, the nodes of the cluster that are like the central nodes uh, globally, but are in the different clusters. So for each cluster, we can also find the node with the highest page rank, for instance, and return this as this is the most influential node globally in this cluster, for instance. So we can also see uh, how they these are distributed across the clusters, and then also visu visualize that in um, in Neo4j itself. Uh, we also did some Bitcoin uh, analysis. Uh, not as much as Jiri, but I got some cool inspirations from this talk, so I will uh, definitely do some more. Uh, so Greg Walker uh, is someone who uh, runs a, uh, a Neo4j graph. Uh, it's on, on a site, it's called Learn Me a Bitcoin. And he continuously imports uh, all the Bitcoin transactions that come along into the Neo4j graph. So currently, this graph has 1.7 billion nodes and 2.7 billion relationships. Uh, so it's um, 240 million transactions, 280 million addresses, and 650 million outputs, 600 gigabytes on disk right now. So the, the data model is a little bit hard to see here. So we have a transaction in the middle, <coughs> which is linked to a block. Uh, and then each block has uh, inputs and outputs. Where's the output? Uh, where's the input? Can't see the input. So here's the output. Uh, the output is pointed to, pointing or locked to an address. The input is also locked to an address. And then there's also uh, the Coinbase as a starting point for, for the blocks. And um, something that I ran first on, on, this, uh, on this large graph was uh, to do a degree distribution for the locked relationship. And something that was really weird for me, at least, was to see that actually, um, although we have like 650 million locked relationships in this graph, um, like the 99.9 percentile only has 28 lock relationships. So the, the degree uh, distribution of these relationships is super tiny. And then there are a bunch that have like 18 million or some, or 1.8 million lock relationships. And uh, Greg explained it to me because I'm Bitcoin noob, so I don't know these things. And he told me, actually, people usually in, in Bitcoin, when they transfer money, they create all and every time new addresses, so they're not traceable. So you don't, you wouldn't send kind of multiple transactions with like the same address, with the same wallet ad wallet address. And that's why most of these addresses have only one transaction or so uh, originating from from it. So you can't trace them kind of. We are multiple transactions, and the and the addresses with these 1.8 million, in most cases, are either payment addresses where like someone posted publicly a payment address, or ransomware. So if you do ransomware, you also have to post your Bitcoin address to so people can pay you, right? And so um, that's actually something that you can find and trace really well in, in Bitcoin graphs. Uh, these kind of all ransomware payments, and you get like a lot of payments co coming in, and you can follow the flow of information. So on, on the on the Bitcoin graph, on the 600 gigabyte graph, it just ran in 300 seconds. And then as the next thing, I wanted to see uh, kind of this kind of address to address virtual network. So kind of uh, looking at which addresses send which uh, um, what amounts to um, uh, to other addresses. So I ran uh, and projected graph again, so with output and logs. So the, this you see this data model is a bit more fine grained than the one that. G used, and then I do the same on the uh, on the edge list as well. I, I find these logs, uh, the first 10 million, I think, is it? And um, so the, these are my two addresses, so address one and address two, and then I just run the algorithm on that. And on these 10 million um, uh, nodes, uh, it runs in 300 seconds a uh, clustering algorithm. So we see that there are certain clusters which have a lot of uh, members, mm -hmm. like. 4.4 million or something like that. Yeah, 4.4 million uh, members, so a really large cluster of people ex exchanging um, uh, money. But then there are also a number of smaller clusters here uh, that, that come, come out of that. So this was some, some experiments that I did uh, on, on the Bitcoin graph uh, about um, the implementation of the graph algorithms. Let's see. Um, Basically, we wanted them to be really easy, really e easy to use. So that means whenever I can write a cipher statement, I also want to run, be able to run my graph algorithm. Uh, so that's why we added them as a user-defined procedure. So you can just call them from your cipher, and uh, there's no extra tooling or infrastructure or anything that you have to set up. 
If you didn't want to have data transfer, could you close the door or cut? Because it's really loud. Um, we didn't want to have data transfer. Um, we wanted to, to run these algorithms in the, in the Neo4j process, uh, uh, which is uh, still live running transactions. So it's not like that we stopped the Neo4j instance to run the algorithms on, but we can say, okay, uh, use the concurrency of X, which is the percentage of your total number of CPUs, and the rest of the Neo4j um, database continues to run transactional workload at the same time while it's also running the graph algorithms. Uh, we wanted to parallelize everything, so make use of all the CPUs that we have available. Uh, so both the um, loading and data structures, computation, and writing back. And uh, we also used a lot of like low-level Neo4j APIs to access the low-level data structure, data in Neo4j really efficiently. And of course, we wanted to scale to billions of nodes and relationships and using hundreds of CPUs and terabytes of RAM easily with these algorithms. And basically, the architecture is like this. Uh, so we, here is our algorithm implementation. We, ac we are accessing uh, Neo4j in parallel to uh, get the data in the, into our data structures, run the algorithm in parallel, and write the results back to Neo4j. And as you can see, for instance, this is an uh, HTOP from a machine with 144 CPUs, which runs page rank, and they're all pretty busy, so that's kind of nice. Uh, so we really utilize our, our CPUs uh, really well. And something that I actually was surprised by, because I didn't expect that, uh, is that it actually performs quite well if you compare it to the published uh, data, for instance, from uh, Spark Gra um, Spark's GraphX. Uh, so for uh, the Twitter uh, 2010 data set, which is 1.5 billion uh, relationships and four, 40, billion, uh, 40 million nodes, um, it's about in the same order of magnitude as, uh, as GraphX. So the blue one is GraphX and the green one is Neo4j, so it's... I expected it to be like an order of magnitude slower, but what we built, but actually we are a little bit faster, so it, it's kind of nice. And um, so, mission accomplished in this uh, space. Something that we started with initially was uh, to limit these gra graph algorithms to two billion nodes and two billion relationships, so that we can use integers everywhere, which makes it much faster to uh, to build and use less memory. But now we are uh, rewriting them to use. Uh, uh, long uh, IDs so we can run uh, to arbitrary sizes. So here's an example of a uh, 300 million node and 18 billion node uh, graph that has 600 gigs on, on disk and uh, page rank with 20 iterations on one machine with 20 threads runs in uh, 1 hour 47 which is pretty, pretty good. And uh, the same for triangle counting on this machine with the same uh, 18 billion relationship graph uh, runs in three hours of 40, 40 minutes, which is also quite nice. So I, I was quite happy about these results. And the uh, new implementation that we have for the large graphs is even more memory efficient than the old one, because we do a inter, uh, data compression num and, uh, of numeric integer arrays uh, and uh, do segments and, and stuff like that. So it's pretty, pretty nice. And I'm looking forward, uh, so we are currently uh, migrating all the other algorithms as well to the uh, huge implementation and then um, are looking forward to test this all out and um, report these results back. So this is kind of the, the scale that our customers want us to, uh, to build for. So they wanted to have like up to tens of billions of nodes and hundreds of billions of relationships and that's something that we are now uh, working on uh, to make this, make this work. So it's mostly uh, like large payment networks and um, people with lots of user transactions, so sites that have like hundreds of millions of users and they want to run their uh, stuff. So um, all this stuff is out there and available, so you can just <laughs> grab it. Uh, it's on, on GitHub. Uh, you can try it out with Neo4j desktop or install it into your Neo, Neo4j server. Um, we'd love to get uh, feedback, so if you try it out, we'd love to hear from you if it worked for you. Were there any things that you would like to have different? Are there certain algorithms that you would like to see? Uh, are there things in terms of usability that should be different or better? And so from that perspective, um, there are also a bunch of um, other examples where people wrote uh, blog posts about using these, data, uh, these graph algorithms on other data sets. So um, Tomasz Bratanik uh, did it with Game of Thrones extensively and with the Yelp data set from, from Kaggle. Uh, my colleague Will did it on the Russian Twitter trolls that have been published by NBC uh, and the uh, US Congress. Um, 
ran uh, graphite rooms on top of that, and then we also have it. Uh, we ran it also on, on Paradise Papers and Panama Papers <coughs> as well. And I want to do more about the Bitcoin analysis. That will be a lot of fun. Okay, cool. Uh, most I, I didn't do. A, much of that except for starting the whole effort and then nudging people to, to do stuff. All the implementation was done by Paul and Martin from, from Dresden, from Avangard Labs, which was really cool, and Tomasz worked on a lot on the docs, and my colleague Mark is taking the project over now for me and, and runs it from now on. And uh, actually he released just yesterday a new release of the graph algorithms, which I have a new of the larger scale algorithms implemented and um, is available now on GitHub and uh, Maven as well. Okay, and with that, I'm done. So even in time. Any questions from you? Yeah, so um, the question was is there any, any way of monitoring the progression of algorithms? So the algorithms uh, output uh, progress into Neo4j's log files. So if you look at the log files, you see where the algorithm is, if they're currently loading or writing or executing, and also all the threads are ex uh, outputting that. We're also thinking about exposing that, for instance, via monitoring tools, so you can also access it via monitoring, or even try to make it work so that the output, uh, the algorithm actually outputs like cipher records, and then kind of via streaming, you would see like the records appearing one by one, but I have to first try out if it actually works across all the different layers of the stack to, to see that. Any other questions?